15% of my area, that tail there, another 15%. 30% of outside the tails, 70% in big chunk in the, in the central region. That's the first number. Between plus and minus one, we contain 70% of our data. So those, those, those two values, that pair, plus and minus one, contain 70%. The next one, between plus and minus two, we capture 95% of our data. So each of the tails then, 2.5% on the left, 2.5% on the right. So this very small area there represents a 2.5% tail. And there would be another 2.5% 95% of my area would be plus or minus 2 standard deviations. That's why this 2 sigma concept, um, you'll see this quite a bit in the course, the 95% interval comes up a lot, it's because it, it, it's, it's nicely related to the plus or minus two, uh, two standard deviations. Another one that you might, might want to remember, though this is less critical, is the, the, the area between plus and minus three standard deviations. That's almost essentially all the area that corresponds to 99.9, something, something. But 99.9% .9 of your area is captured within the plus or minus three standard deviations. So these are important numbers to remember. But uh, the, the main two I'd like to recall are 70% related to plus and minus one standard deviation and 95%. So what we'll do then, we will not calculate these in general by hand. We won't use these formulas. What we will do is we'll tend to resort to the software to do it for us to calculate points on that distribution and to calculate areas under the distribution. We will, however, have to use those in exams. So because we don't have computers in exams, we must use the tables. The table that I handed out last class to you, that is something you must know how to use for the testing exam. All other times for assignments and, and, tutorial, uh, assignments and um, the weekly tests, please use the computer software to calculate areas under the curve for you. Recognize, however, that in the tabular form, we cannot present the normal distribution for all possible distributions of means and standard deviations. So what we do is standard concept, we create what's called the standard form. When I take my variable x, which has some mean and some standard deviation, okay, some arbitrary means and arbitrary standard deviation, not necessarily zero mean and one standard deviation. So here in this, in this this figure that I've drawn, my mean happens to be zero, my standard deviation happens to be one unit. Real distributions don't have that. So we standardize to get this type of distribution. So this standardization comes about all over in statistics. We will see this especially when we get to design experiments with the standard bars. So we'll see this in several classes. We take my x, I shift it to the mean, and I divide through by the standard deviation. That z now, if I go and calculate the mean of z, it's zero. And if I go calculate the standard deviation of z, it's one. So it's a normalized variable or a standardized variable. So after centering, so the numerator expression is, is what's called centering. We're shifting the distribution to the center at zero. Dividing through by the standard deviation, that's called scaling. So after centering and after scaling, I get what's called the standardized variable z. z now has mean of zero, z has standard deviation of one. z also has variance of one. So standard deviation and variance, I will tend to use those terms interchangeably, especially when we're dealing with the normalized distribution or the standardized distribution, because they're the same. And another way we will write this is I will say z is normally distributed error, <laughs> unfortunate error. Um, x is normally distributed. Please correct your notes that x should be normally distributed with mean of mu and variance sigma squared. Z is normally distributed with mean of one, uh, zero, and sigma squared equal to one. So, you may not have this in your notes. I did add these lines a few uh, few hours or days ago. I don't remember when. I've been working on these notes constantly. So 
changes happen all the time. Um, please make sure that you either add this to your nodes or correct this if you have this version that X is normally distributed with mu mu and variance C squared. After standardization, Z is normally distributed with mean of zero and variance equal to one. Okay, please notice that this is sigma squared, it's not sigma. This term here refers to the variance. Standard deviation would be the square root of that. Now, we like standardization because it brings everything to a unified scale. We also like it because it gets rid of the units. So often this normalizing step, my units disappear and Z is dimensionless. It's also very useful because it allows me now to compare any two variables with each other. So if I take one variable, temperature, say measured at the top of my distillation column, I can go standardize it. And then I go measure temperature at the feed to my distillation column. So there are two different temperatures, two different distributions, two different means, two different variances. I go standardize those two variables separately. I now can compare their z's on the same scale. So we like to standardize variables and then work with standardized variables on it. It doesn't change anything about the variable. If this variable x had a long tail to the right, the z variable will still have a long tail to the right. So it doesn't change the shape of the distribution. And that's key. That's very important. Standardizing doesn't alter the shape or the distributional characteristics. It's just a convenient mathematical shift of the data to a, a frame centered at zero with variance of one. The other thing to recognize about our tables is they're huge, they use the form of the cumulative distribution. So we take our regular distribution, the bell shape that we're comfortable with, but we calculate the cumulative area. So there's my regular distribution. What the tables do is they rather use the cumulative area and calculate to be the cumulative area under the distribution. So that at z equals minus infinity, we've got the zero area under the curve. As I move along, I get to the zero point. At the zero point, the area under my curve is 50%. I keep going until I reach plus infinity, essentially. Anything after three sigma really is essentially plus infinity. I've covered 100% of my area. Total area is given by that curve. So like I said earlier, 70% of our area lies between plus and minus one sigma. You're comfortable from your prerequisite stats course of, of, of doing subtraction of areas. So let's take a look at that. If the area between plus and minus one sigma is supposed to be 70%, let's see, the area from minus infinity to minus one is about 15%. The area at plus one is about 85%. The difference between that gets me 70%. So I can get those similar ideas from that curve. Sometimes you know the area and you want to calculate what the corresponding z value is. So what I mean by that is, what is the area under this curve? Let's say I know it's, it's 70%. I've got a, an event that occurs with 70% probability. What is the z value? I would then, I could shade 70% of my area, and then come down and read the corresponding z value related to that. More easily though, I could use the cumulative function and use it in the opposite way. So I know the area, come across, read down and I get the corresponding z. Okay, so this is what the p norm function and the q norm function will do for you in R. The p norm function, you give it a z value, and it will tell you what the area is under the curve all the way from minus infinity up to that z. Value. So p norm of 0, 0.5. Norm of zero is telling me the area from minus infinity on the, my z scale all the way to the midpoint of my my district of my of my normal distribution. This covers 50% of my area. So the p norm function is to get you the cumulative area. The q norm function goes the other way. It says given the area, calculate what the z coordinate is. 
the reason why it's Q here is because this vertical axis is your quantile. So we spoke about quantiles earlier in the, in the class. Your quantiles are, if I sort my data from low to high, what fraction of my data fall within a certain range? The median is our point is our 50% quantile. The median corresponds to my 50% quantile. And so for a normal distribution, the median matches the mean identically. <coughs> so my quantile of 0.5, I come across, I get the mean for the median. The 25% quantile is at what point is 25% of my data covered by the distribution? So 0.25 come across and read down and find the corresponding data. This is the quantiles are not defined at zero and they're not defined at plus one because they correspond to plus or minus infinity. So you must be comfortable with using this uh, these plots. So this really should just be a review, a review for you now. So using those plots, or in fact th these two questions that are up here now, you don't even need the plots to answer. You should be able to, in, in a test or exam, this question should be answered in two minutes. We've got a biological activity of a drug, X. And it's known that this biological activity, when I measure it from historical data, I know it's got a mean of about 27 units. I intentionally left the units off here. The variance is 9 units, 9.3 units. What is the probability of seeing a value of the biological activity? I take a sample. What is the probability that it has biological activity of 30 or lower? Um, the in your, in your, in that case, like, those graphs look the same to me. Sorry? The two graphs are identical to me. Is that just that specific case? Yeah, no, the graphs are supposed to be identical. It's just the, the arrows are quite different here. Yeah, yeah, so it's just the, the order in which you need the graph. Yeah, I just didn't want to jumble them all up. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. Okay, so you could use these graphs or you could use the, the numeric tables to answer this question. But actually, these questions should be answered off the top of your head. You don't even need any table to answer this. Take a look at this for a, for a minute or two and think through what is the biological activity of a drug. Uh, sorry, what would be the probability, I, I mean, of observing a sample that has an activity of 30 or lower? one sigma, the area is 70%, plus an additional 15% from the tape, uh, is, is minus sigma, so there's an additional 15% there, 15 plus 70 is 85%. Okay, the next one. Here I've added units, and this is why I hate working with variants. Variants create this awkward, awkward units. We've got a yield from our batch process, 85 grams per liter is what we're obtaining on average. But the variance is 16 grams squared per liter squared. It's 
standard deviation, 4 grams per liter. What is the proportional yield values that lie between 77 and 93? of the area lies between plus or minus two sigma. These are the sorts of back of the calculation, uh, back of the envelope calculations you must be able to make, which is why I said it's key that you remember these, at least these two numbers, 75% of the area within one standard deviation, 95% of the area within two standard deviations. The reason why it's so important is because in a meeting, you're going to have a colleague who's going to insist that this is an unusual event in the process. You need to be able to say, no, you're wrong. This is extremely normal. This is extremely probable. Or, you're right. This is extremely unusual. You can't go pull out a table of normal distributions. You can't go open up your laptop and start R. You have to be able to be quick on this and say, no, this is, this is normal. This is abnormal. Okay, so remember these two numbers at the very least. So, if someone comes up to you in a meeting and says, let's take a look at these data, this is from our process, uh, perhaps a viscosity or some measurement from your system, are these data normally distributed? judge even from a histogram whether something is normal or distributed or not. The thing that catches you is not the bulk of the data, it's the tails. We can never tell if we've got normally distributed data from a graph. No matter what type of plot, no matter how, how well it's drawn, the histogram or the raw data itself cannot tell you that you must use a QQ plot. So let's take a look at what a QQ plot is. QQ plot stands for quantile quantile plot, and it uses this idea of the inverse uh, cumulative distribution and the cumulative distribution. So these were two we looked at just a minute ago. Here I have superimposed them on top of each other, and so we're going up and looking across to get the cumulative area under the plot. The inverse cumulative distribution is I know my area. What is the corresponding coordinate on the z-axis? Let's take a look at this. This is an extremely useful plot. We're going to use this in every single section of the course following on. So the following approach is you to check if a distribution is, uh, if you've got a set of data, whether that data comes from the normal distribution. The idea is the following. Take your actual data and compare them to data that does come from the distribution you're expecting it to be from. 
and then you do a comparison between theoretical data from that distribution versus the actual data. This is a great idea because this doesn't apply just to normal distributions. I can use this uh, approach I'm going to show you to check if data comes from a chi-square distribution or an F distribution. Many real practical data sets come from those two other distributions. So we can use this uh, in many other ways, not just for normal distributed data. So let's say I've got N actual observations. Someone's given me 10 measurements. Do they come from a normal distribution? So N here is capital, uh, capital N is 10. What I do is let me, let me create 10 normally distributed values that really are normally distributed. I'll sort them from lowest to highest. So I'm ranking them. The first point is going to be the first person tile. The second point is going to correspond to the second person tile. The midpoint will be the 50th person tile. And the final point will be from that last person tile. Remember, these are actually theoretical data from that distribution. So I know this is true that those data are going to follow that, that ranking. And then I'm going to take those data and I'm going to put them on the theoretical distribution and see where they lie. So the way you do this is as follows. Here's the R code. You can take your 10 data points, let's say we've got 10, and create a sequence from 1 to 10. So just use the SEQ function, create numbers 1, 2, 3, up to 10. We shift them down by 0.5, and I'll explain why in a second. So I'm going to create these, this vector P. P is going to be 0 0.05, 0 0.15, and so on, up to 0.95. Essentially, what I've done is I've created 10 points along this vertical axis that I've evenly spaced. 0 0.05, 0 0.15, 0 0.25, 0.35, up to 0.95. Now I'm going to bring them across and bring them down and see where they spread along the z-axis. So 10 evenly distributed points along here, bring them over, and wherever they fall, bring them down to the corresponding z-axis. That's what the Q-norm function does. Q-norm brings me back down to the z-axis. Now you can see why I shifted by 0.5, because if I didn't, I would have a point up at 1, which is infinity. So I can't bring that point down ever. So I, I don't include 0 and I do not include 1. I just start at 0.05 and 0.95. So I create evenly spread data, bring them down to my z-axis. These are theoretical data from that actual distribution. So I know that those z values I get down here, these z's really are from the normal distribution. And I'm going to compare these z's that I've got down here now to the z's that I've actually got. So my actual data, I'm going to compare these to the theoretical z values I've just computed. So here's how you do this. Uh, for the actual data, we standardize the data first. We subtract the mean, mean center, and we scale, divide through by the standard deviation. So mean centering and scaling, I'm going to start using these terms regularly. This is, all it means is mean centering is subtract the mean. Scaling, divide through by the standard deviation. So center and scale the data, or standardize it. Now I've got numbers that typically range. If you've got one, one good, good idea, a good rule to remember is if I take an actual data set with no extreme outliers, if I standardize my data, the resulting data set will have numbers that typically range between plus and minus four. Maybe I'll see the odd number bigger or smaller than Okay, but that's a good rule of thumb. If you standardize and there's no, no real outliers, you'll now get a vector of values that range typically between plus or minus three and four. Okay. So standardize my, my actual data set. Take those z's now, because that's essentially what that is doing, is calculating z's for my actual data. Sort from low to high, and now I compare those z's to my theoretical z's. So here's the code. These uh, are 10 yields from a batch process. These data are on the course website, so you can reproduce it. I just cut the vector out because we don't have space here. Calculate the mean, calculate the standard deviation. Calculate the z. z is equal to the actual values minus the mean divided through by the standard deviation. Please make use of this fact in R that you can have variable names with periods in them. It helps to create good looking and easy to read source code. So, the mean of the yields, the standard deviation of the yields. 
here I can calculate the z values of the fields. Let's sort those from low to high. That's this, this bullet point up here. And so what you need to compare now is this row versus this final row. This row up here is the actual z values of this final row on my theoretical z values. Are these data normally distributed? This is not an effective way to check that. What is more effective is let's plot this. So if I plot these, I should get a 45 degree line. Okay, if I'm plotting theoretical values on my horizontal, uh, the actual z values on my vertical, I'm not going to get an identical 45 degree line, but I should see those data line up in an absolute 45 degree line. When you plot this, plot, please make absolute sure, absolutely sure that your length of your x-axis is the same as your length of your y-axis. Many software packages will distort this plot and show this axis horizontally at twice the size of the vertical axis. You cannot then accurately judge a 45 degree line. So you must make sure that you've got a one-to-one -one aspect ratio when you plot data, when you're trying to make a comparison between the x and y axis. Can you also say superimpose a line? Yeah, so there we go. <laughs> so there's a, here's the function to do in R. QQ plot will do all the work for you. You have to do nothing. You don't have to do any of the standardization. You don't have to select any of those equally distributed points on the y-axis. That R code I gave you is just to explain the concept. So QQ plot, one word, all lowercase, and you give it your x raw data, the raw data. It takes care of all the calculations for you. Then you want to add a line on top of it called QQ line, and it simply adds that 45 degree line. Far more usefully, though, is let's use the car library. So on the tutorial on the course website, there's a, uh, there's a section that shows how to enhance R with additional packages. The car library is written by a professor here in sociology at McMaster. Um, he teaches a great graduate level course. If you ever come to Mac and take grad studies here, he teaches a phenomenal 700 level course. He's written a number of libraries for R and um, surprisingly in sociology, not in statistics, which is his department. So I use his library. It does a great job for many functions. We will use the QQ plot function from that library. It's QQ lowercase capital P L O T. <coughs> This R is case sensitive, the two functions are different. This library will show, uh, will show the 45 degree line and will give you 95% confidence balance. Because that's arguably more useful than just the 45 degree line. We, we know that these data are not going to lie identically on the 45 degree line. There is going to be some spread. How much spread is acceptable? Well, that's what these theoretical uh, confidence limits do for you. So let's take an example. I'd like to use data that's relevant to you. Here are the grades from the 4 in 4 final exam from last year, which most of you wrote. QQ plot. What does this mean? The fact that these few students scored outside the 95% confidence region is okay. The 95% confidence region is exactly that. Five out of 100 points will fall outside the region. There are 87 students that wrote the exam. There's one, two, three, four, five data points outside. It's about what I expect. So normally distributed, what was the exam's average? Zero, read across, it was about 65 to 67, something like that. 
are 70% of the students within the plus and minus one standard deviation. In other words, do 30% of the students fall outside the plus or minus one sigma tail? 87 students <coughs> times 70%, or what the tail is 30, that gets to bring me about 24 data points. If you count the number of data points outside plus one and below minus one, there's 26. So absolutely, this follows a normal distribution to almost every single Definition is this surprising? Absolutely not. When professors are amazed that the data from their exams and their grades are normally distributed, it indicates they do not understand the central limit theorem. Let's take a look back and see why. Central limit theorem says the following Take data from any distribution, independent samples. So what's on an exam? An exam, there's, there's questions. There's questions, 10 questions. Their questions are independent of each other. You get a grade for every question. The exam's average is exactly this. Take independent samples, calculate the average, x. x then says this is as it becomes from the normal distribution. So, as long as you're writing the exam independently, the grades from the exam will be normally distributed. I have never seen grades from anything that's not normally distributed. And it makes even more sense if you think about it. On all my exams, there's easy questions and there's difficult questions. The easy questions are going to have a distribution that's shifted to the one way. The hard questions are going to have grades shifted off to the left. If I look at the distribution of those grades. So these are not data from the normal distribution. I'm taking data from crazy distributions. Every question has a very different distribution. But I'm computing your average x bar, it's going to be from the normal distribution. Every single time, without doubt. As long as you all write the exam independently. Okay, so that's always met because you're all going to write the exam independently. So we don't get surprised by this sort of thing. You said that the axes had to be one-to-one -one ratio. Okay, good question. So here they're not. In this original example over here, the axes are one-to-one -one ratio. What the card library will do for you and the QQ plot from R, both of them will rescale this axis so that it's in terms of the original units. And it does that for convenience. It's easier for us to interpret that rather than our z-axis. But you can be sure that this line then is the correct line that was calculated in the 45 degree coordinate system and then just converted over. Okay, so just to recap then, we've, we've looked at this distribution, we've calculated areas under uh, different regions. We've calculated this new z coordinate system, or shown this new z coordinate system that we will use pretty much from this point onwards. And then we've gone and looked at a bit of the central limit theorem. Let's take a look at a bit more about the central limit theorem. There's some important information here that we haven't looked at yet. I say that if I take data from any distribution, no matter what, and I sum them up and I get an x bar, I'm going to get an estimate x bar that as if that x bar came from the normal distribution. Now, why, why is this useful for us? Well, if you think about a process that you're maybe responsible for. And you need to go calculate the performance metric for the process, the average yield or typical conversion values. You don't go to your Excel spreadsheet and look at the last data point and say, this is what, how my process operates. And you don't just go take a single number of how it's operated in the recent history and say, this is the characteristic of my process. What you're used to doing and what you're used to do, I'm sure, is you would go look at your database and take a whole lot of data and compute an average. That's exactly what this is saying. That as long as those data points you select are independent, that average you've gone and calculated, x bar, is far more representative. You're also very comfortable with the fact that if, I'm, if you went and only calculated that average using five data points, how would that be a good estimate of your performance? 
versus if I had taken 100 data points, the past 100 days of operation, and calculated the average from that. Would that be a more accurate estimate of your, of your process's behavior? So we're clear that if we use more data, we're going to get better estimates. And this is what the central learning theorem tells us. Let's take a look. That mean that I compute is called x bar. The variance I can go compute as well. We'll talk about that in the next class, but I can go compute the variance in the usual way. But here's the information that's, that's new and that's interesting. This x bar I calculate up here, that x bar has a mean of mu and it has a standard a variance of sigma squared over n. That mu refers to this distribution's mu. I don't know this distribution is new. I don't, in many situations, I do not know the population mean. I do not know the population variance. But the central limit theorem tells me that x bar that I calculate here, that's going to come from a normal distribution with the same mean, the population mean. So even though I don't know this distribution is mean, this x bar is going to come from a, 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 a population uh, distribution with that same mean. And it's going to have a variance of sigma squared by n. Let this let's, let's, let's sink in because this is important. X bar, I'm saying, comes from a distribution. Things that come from a distribution implies that they vary. This is important to understand. This is, this is the crux of the, of the central law theorem. Recognizing that X bar itself is a variable. I calculate this mean over here. But if I go a few days later and take data from the same system, these are now different samples, however, I'm going to calculate a different x bar. And I can repeat this a few times. Take several snapshots of data and calculate an x bar. Take another set of data from the same system, calculate a different x bar. I'm going to recalculate x bar, x bar, x bar a few times x bar itself is clearly a variable. I'm going to get different x bar values every time. What is the distribution of those x bar values is a normal distribution with the same mean as this, this original distribution's mean. That's good. That's in fact extremely desirable because it says that I'm going to summarize the behavior of the process with, a, with an average of certain values, that average that I'm going to calculate is coming from a distribution with the same population mean as this original distribution. The benefit is that the variance of x bar, so this is the distribution for x bar, is that the variance is going to be much smaller. It's going to be sigma squared over n. So the more samples I take, the smaller and smaller that variance or that distribution is going to be. And this is intuitive. If I take five samples and I average them, I'm going to get one type of variance. If I take 100 samples, I'm going to reduce that variance substantially. The more data I use to calculate that average, the more accurate that average is going to become, the tighter and tighter this distribution is going to be. Okay, so let me show that to you um, here graphically as a plot. The thin line is the raw data that I'm sampling from. I calculate the average of five data points randomly selected from this distribution with a, with a thin black line. That average x bar is going to come from a distribution and given by the thick black line. So x bar comes from a distribution with the same mean but with a different variance a tighter variance, a smaller variance. Okay. And there's a bit of software uh, code I've put on the course website to show that you can go, go use it in R. Um, so let me just show you here on the univariate section of the course. There's, um, here's the data for the QQ plot that I just went through a few minutes ago, so you can go reproduce that. But then down here is the data for, um, for proving to yourself the central limit theorem reduction variance. And essentially what it does, I'll just I'll just run the code rather than um, going through it line by line. And we'll go through it visually. Okay, so 
Okay, so what this plot is doing is here on the right hand side of the raw data, I've taken 100 samples of raw data, and it comes from a particular distribution, I don't really care which. As long as it's finite variance and it has a certain mean. Then I go take data point one and two, and I calculate the average, and I plot that here. Take data point three and four, calculate the average, and put that here. Five and six, seven and eight. So at the end here, I've got 50 data points. I started with 100, I've taken averages of twos, I'm going to land up at 50 data points. Notice here that the mean of these 50 data points is about the same as the mean from these original 100, but the variance has come in. If I repeat that process now and I take groups of four, I take one, two, three, four, average them, plot that point over here. And I keep going and I get 25 new data points here. Same mean, even for smaller variance still. So the more data you have, the tighter your variance. And in the code here, you can go replace, I've used the normal distribution to begin with, but I've got the code there, I could have gone and used the F distribution, or the T distribution, or the chi-square distribution. It doesn't matter what your raw data's distribution is, you will always observe that, that narrowing of the variance. So that's important. It says the more data we use, the better our estimates become. And that's something we know intuitively, but it's good to see that it's got a theoretical basis. So what I'd like to just introduce here in the last few minutes is this case study. And I want you to think about it and we'll pick it up next time, because this is going to start to introduce the idea of confidence into it. This case study is a company that I worked with a few years ago in France. They create uh, polymer bays, and they need to take samples from them and calculate the viscosity. That viscosity is obviously a crucial quality metric for them, because they sell that to their customers who make medical devices from them, and they want to have that to put through their extruders to create the medical device with the characteristics required. So here's some raw data in coded form. I've calculated the mean and I've calculated the standard deviation method. And let's assume that we take these samples from a population where sigma is known to be the I will remove this assumption later on for now, but you know, use this arbitrarily. Those nine data points of viscosities, they're taken independently from the, from the bale, from the plastic bale. I can go and calculate then x bar, which I've done up here. And then we say the distribution of that x bar is as if it comes from a normal distribution with population u, the same as the theoretical, uh, sorry, the same as the, the population mean. So I don't know what that is, but I know that it comes from a distribution where that mean is the same as the original population. And the variance is going to be sigma squared over n. Let's go construct a z interval for x bar. This seems weird, right? I'm constructing a z value for x bar. x bar is this average of nine values. But I can go and construct a z value for it. So x bar is a value of 20. I want to go standardize it and bring it to this normalized coordinate system. Standardization says subtract the mean and divide through by the, uh, by the standard deviation. This is the general rule for standardizing. Minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. Well, the mean for x bar is mu. And the standard deviation for x bar is sigma over root n. So I know, using the central limit theorem, I know what the theoretical mean is going to be, and I know what the population standard deviation and variance are. So I can go substitute those in here. Minus the mean minus mu divided through by the standard deviation. So now I've calculated a z value for this x bar, this average. What I can go do now is I can go say, well, that is the z axis. I can say, well, can I find bounds on this scale of z that gives me the probability or a confidence that I'm going to find that x bar in those bounds. And that's what where we're going with the confidence, is to find that bounds, let's say between plus and minus two, that will contain that z value with a certain 95% um, confidence. 
I know what those plus and minus two values correspond to on my y-axis here, on, this, on the cumulative area. And so I can go substitute in z with those values. So I just want you to think that over. And what I'd like to do is before next class, I'll take a look over here at slide 57 and try to understand what, what's going on here in this role.